First, I want to thank you for coming here for this breakout session, uh, which basically we're looking at how do we translate what we know, our experience, into public policy and into health and food protection law. First, my thanks to Doug Reynolds and Pam Devine uh, for giving me this opportunity and you know, basically putting a space in these conferences to have. I look at this as sort of our town hall meeting for uh, the activist-minded uh, folks that come to these conferences. And it's very important because it's a moment that we can share together, exchange information, and get some ideas. Okay, yeah, all right, yeah. sorry, that's what I'll do that, okay. So, a little bit about me. Uh, I'm 55 years old, I'm an uh, attorney, government relations professional, I'm based in New York, uh, and in 2002 I was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, the family history of diabetes, my late father had diabetes, and my mother, who's going to be 85, she has uh, type di of diabetes as well. So, I go on metformin on diagnosis, and then in 2008, I advanced to Janamet. On March 29, 2014, I had a heart attack, and I had a stent, stent placement uh, in the circumflex artery on March 31st, 2014. Uh, after that stent placement, I was discharged, and I had was placed on three other prescription drugs, so I was on a total of five drugs uh, when everything was over. And, uh, and then I began my low-carb keto diet in July 2014. Uh, I had had the privilege to work with the late Dr. Robert Atkins in the early 90s. And um, just after he passed away, I uh, kind of uh, strayed and, and started listening to my other doctors and kind of went off the low-carb wagon. Uh, and I pay for it. Uh, so I go, uh, I start the diet in July 2014 against the advice of my primary care provider was telling me, oh, we gotta watch, it's gonna be dangerous, so forth. He says, we gotta check you out, do a lot of lab, blah, blah, but I said to him, listen, I'm gonna do it. So then he calls me up in September of 2014 after a first set of labs and he says to me, what are you doing? <laughs> I said, why doc? He says, I got good news for you. I said, you've got a normal A1C. You don't need to be on Janamet anymore. And uh, I make sure to make, make a point of this, that, that it's so important that we've got to keep track of the costs of these drugs and things. So what I like to you know, kid around, and I post it on Twitter, that uh, the CEO of Merck gets, has a $25 million compensation package. And that in 2008, I started contributing to his salary. And in September 2014, I, I stopped contributing to the salary. And that's, a, that's one of the challenges of, of this diet, and we're gonna talk about it, and why you'll have to understand that there's some resistance, so you have to explain to people so that they can think about it and understand it logically and rationally uh, what's going on. So by within a year, by a year later, in 2015, I come off all my prescription drugs uh, for heart disease and diabetes, and something that I tell everybody to do, and you should do if you have a similar situation, is that once you come off the drugs, or the prescription drugs, you should start keeping account of how much money you're saving yourself and your health insurer. So my aggregate savings to date now is $23,000. Because the business model is that they expect the person's going to be on medication for a lifetime and advancing in more progressive medication. So. It's really a terrible, it's a great business model for profits, but it's a really bad one for the person. I returned to my college weight, clothing size, and other disclosures. I'm a board member of the National Alliance for Better Nutrition, which is an arm of the Nutrition Coalition, uh, which uh, our good friend here, Michael, is uh, in the audience here representing uh, the, uh, uh, the Nutrition Coalition, and they're doing great work. I represent clients in this community and on these particular issues. Most recently, I represented a parent of a type one diabetic child uh, where allegations of abuse were made because uh, she was uh, 
working on um, trying to get her daughter's a uh, blood sugar under control. But the, the matter was resolved and, and settled. But the point is that these are real issues that affect people on very personal levels. And also, to be fair, I, I, at the suggestion, I'm contemplating a run for public office in New York next year. I'm not going to disclose which uh, office, because then that will trigger some other legal requirements on me. But I'm just basically saying that um, I'm using this presentation in part as for my own policy and legislative legal development in New York and in Wester Westchester County where I reside. So the question we come from all these conferences, how do I take what I learned from my own experience and help others in my community? The principle one is all politics is local. The content will be different because what may be going on in Westchester is different than what's going on in Seattle or in California or wherever you, wherever you came from. But everything is still local and you have to look at it with those optics. So what I came up with, and this is sort of a working uh, document, uh, it would be the core operating principles, COPs, from which we can begin to apply and transform the health and food policies in, in, in our states and communities as the basis to create the policies uh, that can work in your communities. So core operating principle number one, if it does not get measured, you do not know, and it will not get fixed. And the measurements actually begin with yourself. So I, as a diabetic, have now have a discipline where I'm always measuring uh, my blood sugar and ketones and keeping and tracking all of these things and also weight and body fat and all these other metrics because that's the only way that I can intelligently make decisions about what I'm going to eat and what I'm going to do. Uh, and then, after you do these measurements, um, you, you have to look at what are the costs. So if you, if you were taking prescription drugs or whatever, you should keep track of what you're spending or, what's, or the costs that are involved. Because part of the, this, part of the, the approach in using this mindset is that you're going to then expand it into your own community and then you will start to see how profound and dramatic these impacts are in your, uh, in your community and what some of these chronic and metabolic diseases. And you use that to actually accumulate data. So find out how many people are affected by diabetes or obesity in your county, in your town, in your state. And that's how you can start to begin to have an intelligent conversation with elected officials or politicians. And the concept is, is what's called syndromic surveillance. Does everybody understand what that is? OK, syndromic surveillance means a watching the occurrence of a manifestation of a condition. So uh, in 2002, I had the opportunity to go and meet with then Health and Human Services Secretary Tommy Thompson. Uh, and his staff, and we got a tour of the operations center at the Department of Health and Human Services. And it's like what you see on TV, this auditorium with big screens on the wall, and there are literally a map of the United States and the planet, and constant 24-7 monitoring of health, health conditions, viruses, outbreaks, whatever, whatever, and tracking it so that decisions can be made. And if help or resources need to be deployed, they can do that. Same idea. How many people in your community suffer from diabetes? How many people suffer from heart disease? How many people suffer from whatever the chronic illnesses are? And getting that, elevating that mindset, then you can begin to start taking it to another level. And when you get data, as John Adams said, facts are stubborn things. And we need to use facts uh, to support our arguments because when I argue with people, for example, who are for another diet or they say, oh, you're, it's dangerous or whatever, and I say, well, how is it dangerous if I've been now, I'm, I'm off my prescription drugs and I feel great, I'm back at my college weight, so how, how is this dangerous to me? I think I'm a danger 
to the pharmaceutical industry or, or to the processed food industry because I'm because I'm not I'm not giving my money to those guys anymore. So this is very important way the easiest way that you can do go when you go back home to your communities start a meetup group. Create a little group of people, and that's how you can start to make some change. Uh, I want to start a New York uh, or Westchester County Diabetes Remission Keto Low Carb Group. You know, that's kind of a working name right now. But I want to get people together so that way we can share our own experiences and recipes and information, and then we inform and empower one another. Same principle applies. You should all be thinking about doing that. Uh, at your own, and, you know, when you go back home. The second core operating principle is nutritional literacy and metabolic comprehension. Now, what do I mean by that? It's the uh, it's the idea that instead, you know, we don't need guidelines. If anything, we our experience with guidelines has been terrible. What we need is to learn how to think about and understand health information and nutrition that begins with doctors and patients. And unfortunately, most doctors don't have the background or not taught in medical school. Uh, and they've relegated the nutrition profession to operate on a false assumption that people need to have um, you know, a registered dietitian or somebody, <coughs> another into another party to steer them with uh, or guide their uh, nutrition information when really what people need is just to understand how things work. Like yesterday, how many people saw Dr. Ted Naiman's uh, talk? And I uh, great. That was, I thought, a wonderful uh, class on a basic level to understand energy and nutrition and that most people with uh, a basic education can begin to understand and how and why, well gee, maybe this is why I'm fat or this is why I have these problems because now he laid it out in a very easy way. That's actually the job of a, a health professional is to provide that information, is to be a coach uh, for that person, not a, uh, a master or a dictator or it say here's this information and working with you to actually get you results where <laughs> Seriously, you're, you're, the, the professional puts themselves out of business. You know, it's like almost as a lawyer, I tell my clients and in a situation, we can do this and you can pay and this is what the law says and this is what the likely outcome is going to be or we can save time, we can save money, and we can make some decisions and you can have some choice about what your outcome is going to be by getting into a negotiation, mediating the problem. Because if you don't, the judge and the law is going to make the decision for you. You may not like that. So um, we all learn in these things that health and nutrition and these things are well, that's a full contact sport. You can't sit and be idle. Uh, in the media, the media loves to sensationalize this uh, uh, information on nutrition and health. So you have to see yourself in the role of correcting incorrect information, and also sharing verifiable information. So you should be, you know, if you've got a story to tell, get the word out, contact the reporter, call the newspaper, call the TV station, have your information with you to support, hey, this is where I was, this is what happened to me, this is how whatever, whatever I've done changed my life, or how I used keto low carb. I mean, they will not be able to argue when you can say, this was me at this point, I was diabetic, I was on all these medications, and this is me today. And it's simply because I made some basic changes in what I was eating and the choices I was making. So very important, because the media drives a lot of this stuff. And also the media is manipulated, uh, as we've seen on the whole, uh, some, some forces try to create a phony story about keto, ketogenic diets. Uh, and women's health, and, and it's just ridiculous. Uh, so why is there opposition and resistance to change? Well, as I said, keto low carb gets people off medications. Keto low carb 
gets people to eat real, fresh foods and avoid processed foods. So we are an interruption in a business model. And people don't like that. And it also serves, uh, it's a model that works off of, or feeds off of people that are, have been ignorant, are not fully informed because of the, as I pointed, the literacy. So we have to become champions for nutritional literacy and metabolic comprehension. And then it also, as I said, it challenges the basis of some health professions, like registered dietitians. I mean, if you are nutritionally and metabolically literate, you can make better decisions, and dietitians really be our coaches. And it's the only way also by holding your health professionals accountable. Because if you're not getting better with the doctors and the professionals that you're, you're dealing with, fire your doctor. And, and I know that's easy to say. Some people may not have a lot of choices, but you've got to do something. If you're not getting the results, you've got to, you've got to find else. You know, working with the doctor is, uh, and, uh, is like uh, it's an interviewing process. You've got to feel comfortable because you share the most intimate and most personal information, and you put literally put your life in the hands of that person. So you really want to have uh, a good relationship with that, and you want to know that your doctor it supports you. So like another in my, as a follow up in my story, my cardiologist supports me, <clears throat> congratulated me. Uh, we, we, had, we celebrated our, our five years and I, when she came to me at the emergency room and today she's Stephen and I spoke with her at the end of March and she said, you're one of my best patients. And you're the most motivated patients. And yes, you can eat meat, I'm, I'm persuaded, I'm sold. <laughs> And my primary care, he's like, cool, I got it. I see your labs, we do the annual, you're, you're doing fine, Tony. So, you know, that's, that's the kind of relationship you want to have with your professionals. Yeah, so, going back to it's, it's creating an atmosphere of competition and acute accountability in health and nutrition is a good thing. Beware of one size fits all agendas for humanity. And that's what's going on with this vegan eat forum thing which sounds wonderful. They're gonna save the planet and save humanity by telling everybody what they, what they can eat and how much. Crazy. And in fact, instead of worrying about what humanity's gonna eat four or five decades from now, why don't we talk about what's going on right now, right here. And it's really sad and unfortunate because there's so much money that's in being placed here and resources. And imagine if we were doing that to actually go after and help people, you know, the OB atrocious diabetes epidemic and obesity epidemic that's overwhelming the planet. Really, really bad. So um, we have to develop, you have to think about developing ways to oppose this, this imposition that's uh, being made upon you. So same thing like with these dietary guidelines. It's like the question we should be asking, well, who are they for? Do they apply to me? Why should they, why do they apply to all of us? And the, the, these are, you have to put it right back in, 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 in the question to the, to the folks that are promoting this. Because they're operating under, the, under the, what I believe is a false presumption that they're, they're here, this is how they validate their, um, their role in humanity. They're here to pr protect and take care of and save us. Well, if we really want to help protect humanity, the best thing is to have is an educated, informed, empowered people. Not, not treating humanity like a bunch of lemmings. So how can we establish that? Well, we must connect with food and farmers. They are critical protectors of health, nutrition in our communities. And how many people here in the audience buy their meat direct? Very easy, you should look into it. You should find out where ranchers are in your in your state and and buy there. If, if they're not good choices available, there's several companies out there. There's uh, Crowd Cow, there's Butcher Box, uh, Pasture Road. They're out there, so please, you know, and they're not that much more expensive. I I spent time explaining to people. Well, they, they when I'm asked, well, how can you afford to to buy? food like this or spend this much. And I said, well, number one, I'm not eating three meals a day. 
I only eat when I'm hungry, and that really averages out to like once or twice a day. And like, for example, if I had a meal, like I had a meal last night with uh, Sean Baker and Ira Cummins and all that, I mean, I'm still, I'm still <coughs> running on that ribeye I had last night. I'm not even hungry or thinking about it. And that's also the beauty of that once you follow this approach, you literally are fat adapted and you don't, it's fasting and, and not going without eating food for extended periods of time is not an overwhelming or, an, or uncomfortable uh, way to, to live. And you can, uh, the key is to always stay hydrated. Uh, so buy direct, and then how many people here visit or have taken their children to visit farms or ranches? Great, right. that's so important. Something that I wanna do in New York is I wanna look at how the state is using in its education programs, how we can have kids go back and start visiting farms and learning about how food is produced and raised. And we need to do that. And there's a, actually a great film, a documentary about called The Forgotten Farms. Uh, and it's forgottenfarms.org. And then it's a documentary. I recommend it. And then something else here, what I call here, is slaughter or sacrifice. We need to also start rethinking about how our regard uh, for food and that uh, that really a sacrifice is being made, whether it's a plant or an animal, life is, is being given up to sustain your own life. And so maybe we should be more uh, reverent of that exchange that's taking place. So we refer to slaughterhouses, but I, you know, recently when I was in Spain, I was taken, uh, you know, I was in, impressed that um, on a particular piece of steak or meat there, if you go to the butcher there, they can tell you when that animal was sacrificed, what gender it was, it can keep their stats and statistics and their chain of where that animal was raised, what it was raised on, That's, it, it just shows a sort of a, a high regard and respect for, for food, particularly meat. The same, and this is one of the problems that we have with food safety. If we don't know where the food is coming from, how it was raised, then if there's a problem in contamination or some other problem, it makes it so difficult. But so we have to reestablish this regard and reverence for the food that we eat. So you know, you have to think think about that. And I mean, I don't know uh, what uh, state of Washington is like uh, for the Seattle, local Seattle folks, but get your people, get the, get your kids, get visit the farms and, and and learn about how the how the food and who's providing it for you, and support those people. So, fourth operating principle is that health nutrition promotion is actually an existential threat to a sickness management profit model to big pharma and big food. Big pharma only cares about writing prescriptions and keeping on those, writing those prescriptions for as long as they can, as long as the patient lives. And big food only cares about consumption, consumption, consumption. That's why this morning, when they did the neuro marketing, uh, they, they talked about that. I found that fascinating because that's part of the problem. Um, and, this, and the threat is, again, you stop using or you reduce prescription drug use. You stop buying food that's processed in a bag or a box. And, and then there is the other thing you have to be wary of is where is their false marketing? The, the psychology of eating certain foods will be better for me and the planet, and it's okay that I pay more for such pro products when in fact it is unproven and questionable it will work. This is case in point is this impossible burger or beyond meat. Just, I mean, the whole thing's crazy. Those those burgers cost more than a regular pound of beef. They have all kinds of uh, in, uh, additives, ingredients add to it, and even there's some stuff that there isn't lengthy experience with humanity eating uh, some of the, mm -hmm. the uh, engineered uh, ingredients that are in those products. Uh, so identify and call out false marketing. Don't fall of it. And this goes back to the whole question of ethics. 
So it's an ethical, you have to you have to ask or question, what are the ethics behind this? I mean, are we going to live and function as a society or as a state where the only thing that matters is we sell as much food as possible, sell as many prescription drugs as possible, and people stay sick and don't get well? And so there needs to be corporate ethics on this. And I think that's a, a greater challenge in a bigger context for the whole country and the world. But we need to start working on that. And again, everything begins with yourself. It begins at a local level. You know, last uh, operating principle that um, is the that I've developed here so far is beware of global agenda. So, who is making health recommendations or guidelines for you? And you always have to be. This is sort of the not sort of, this is the aspect of questioning authority, being a critical thinker. So it doesn't mean that, that people providing information are bad or have bad intentions, but it's important to understand what is behind it. And again, there is a global agenda to make uh, humanity become vegetarian or vegan on the, on the belief that that's going to save the planet and resolve all of the chronic health problems that exist, and we know that that's just not the truth. Then there's also unfair competition, where you know part of the people that are driving this are the big companies, and then you even have this vegan billionaires. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm I'm calling out. We you know our side. If there's any billionaires, why look at you? We we need your help. We need you to get involved. Uh, you can't sit idle. Uh, so so what's my policy agenda for New York as I'm developing this, as I think about putting myself into a larger stage and what I would do or will do if I'm fortunate enough to serve the people in my state. Well, in New York State, we have a terrible diabetes problem. In fact, over $1.5 billion in Medicaid dollars are spent in diabetes care. And that's a lot of money. And when I talked to the state controller about this, and I always remember when we talked about this, he said, my goodness, I wish I could, these costs, we could get these costs down because we need this money for other projects or other things that the state needs. But obviously we have to allocate this money because it's for the people, for their health. Uh, and so the way that you can do this, the best way is to develop a pilot project. There are hospitals and universities, your local uh, health care centers that will be interested in testing this out. There are practitioners who want to test this out. And the proof is in the, in the pudding. When you get results, once people start improving their health markers and no longer start coming off medication, those costs are gonna come down. And then on top of that, you reward. There has to be an incentive. So, you know, what I would argue, what I will argue in New York is that if we can, you know, we should share those savings with the institutions and the professionals that got these results. Good results deserve to be compensated. And then the other kind of other thing that I like to see in New York is re what I, something that I call reconnect New York. There's a problem in, in my state of New York. There's New York City, and then there's upstate New York. And when you go visit either place, they're completely different, and they seem to forget about each other. Or, and it's actually one part of just a really wonderful state. The city has so much to offer, and so does upstate New York. I had the privilege to go to um, my undergraduate. I went to Cornell, and so I got to spend time in upstate New York. And uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful state. So I want to reconnect New Yorkers. Uh, and I'd like to also do it starting with food. So I would like to see farm visits as part of education in school. Maybe we need to go back to home economics courses for, for kids. Uh, we need to publicize farms. People don't know where their farms are located, where they can get fresh eggs, dairy, meat or produce once in a while, you know, you'll see that when you have a festival, 
we have, or you hear about the county fair. But we need better publicity for farmers markets. And then something else I would like to see, and I don't know how prevalent it is in other states, but when we go to the supermarket, I'd like to see in the supermarket an actual section of the supermarket where it's just totally devoted to either New York State or food that's been sourced within like a 300 mile radius so that when the customer goes into the supermarket and say, I want to buy local, it's clear, it's there, it's right there in their face, and it, it, the person can say, gee, I, this is how I want to support the economy. I would support my local economy and, and have that made available. So there's some ways that, that we can do that uh, by putting some requirements uh, on supermarkets. And it's something that, uh, again, uh, I, I will do if, if, uh, if, I'm, if I'm so fortunate to have the opportunity to serve. The other thing is uh, I'm looking at is, and based on Peter and Ballastad, uh the whole concept of regenerative agriculture. So we need to think about, and this is a problem all across the country, is uh, in dealing with the whole carbon and environmental situation, we, we really should be looking into how we can foster and support regenerative agriculture programs. And I'd like to see that happen in New York. And I'd like to see medical education and license requirements um, modified <coughs> so that doctors actually actually have to be taught nutrition and metabolics. Uh, not just, not just uh, writing, you know, it's all pharmacology and almost no nutrition. And I want to protect doctors who are using these therapies to help people, uh, because sometimes doctors are are assaulted by by members of their own profession, not because they harmed anybody, but because they're not doing it like anybody else, and they're getting results. And you know, if you're getting good results, that should speak for itself. Because doctors who are saving lives, those are the kind of doctors who are changing lives for the better. Those are the kind of doctors that we want. And no one is saying that no doctor should that there shouldn't be some oversight, and that's why you have licensing boards. But there needs to be a balance in 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 the treatment of this, and this is why it's also important. This other project that was discussed here about establishing a standard of care for keto low carb that also has to be done because the practice of medicine is something that your state does. The federal government does not regulate the practice of medicine. Look, the individual states do that. Another reason why, or again, you have to get involved at the local level. Another thing that I'd like to see, again, is the standards, uh, to, to establish some standards for evaluation of health information and its marketing. Uh, you know, like uh, Dave Diamond talked about yesterday about how the public doesn't understand the difference between absolute and relative risk. And the simple fact that people don't understand that, you get these sensational marketing campaigns about pharmaceutical drugs like on the statins, when we need to change that or change the requirements so that there's transparency. When a company says, oh, we reduced, the re we, re we had a 43% reduction in heart attack, really? Well, you know, is that absolute risk or relative risk? And then the other thing that, that that we also want to be interested in, and that's something that Dave Feldman talked about, is all cause mortality. So we may want we want to we want better quality health information in our marketing so that people can make intelligent choices. So that is an overview, and I thought about that that's plenty of uh, plenty of meat right there to get started on uh, for anybody who wants to um, change the landscape in their uh, in their home state in their community um, I just want to open up now the, the floor to any questions or comments or thoughts um, because this is a this is a process and I hope that I've I've inspired you to uh, do some things on the local level so that we make the uh, make think the country and your, your homes uh, your home communities better places yeah I had a question, or more of a statement. So, in there's a UK MP, Tom Watson, he lost yeah. like 170 pounds, and it became big news. And it seems like that gained the attention of the other 
MPs, right? And Correct. so that kind of drives yes. agenda. I'm sure we have plenty of obese congressmen, and I don't pay attention to that. But wouldn't it be very, very helpful on a national scale to kind of have the powers that be in places like this to approach those people and say, let's do an experiment, let's see how you do. You can take it back to your district and share your results. And is there just is there no way to get through to those people because they entrenched well, in a system? Well, what you're talking about is the again, it's personal connection. Yeah. So in New York. <laughs> That's really where I can speak. I know of, of some legislators who have diabetes, who have issues. They know my story. And I've said to them, why don't you try this? Or why don't, we, why don't we work together on doing this in your district or in this area of the state? Um, the, the elected official is moved by personal stories and personal connections. So that's why it's important to go to town hall meetings uh, and, and share your stories. Even to go just for that purpose. Say, hey, Mr. Senator, Congressman, legislator, public official, do you know I had this condition at it and I, I had been following this diet and all these wonderful things happened for me. Why aren't we doing more? Uh, why, what can we be doing here to study this more? So that, that's very important, but personal connection absolutely will drive an issue. And you can bet if, if I'm fortunate enough to serve, I will be a big champion. You will be hearing about it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I, I wanted to comment on the current challenge in uh, the, the political climate that we're living in at the moment, where from my observations, it seems that one of the most pressing challenges is resisting a cycle of um, tribalism that can become toxic over time. And uh, kind of as a provider and just it, from a policy framework and democracy, what I'm interested in supporting um, is, a, uh, is, is a ethos of dietary autonomy. I, I want the ability to work out for myself and maybe with the appropriate medical providers I work with. And I think that's an interest that we would share with a huge, um, almost anybody with dietary concerns I think wants the freedom to do that. I think anybody with, who, who is vegan or expresses that way, I want them to feel free in whatever state they live in in the United States to make those choices for themselves. Um, so I would encourage, in a way, framework of having a coalition of people that just want dietary freedom. And then I personally, as a citizen too, I want customized medicine and I want some agency over my healing process with my doctors. Um, so I just, I want to encourage a framing where it doesn't become tribal and it's not that we're trying to convert everyone to a meat diet, that I think part of what I hear the core is, is just wanting to advocate for some dietary autonomy and customized right. medicine. I, I, I totally agree with you. I mean, I say to people, if you, if you want to be vegan, be vegan. If vegan works for you, fantastic. It becomes a problem when you say to other people, no, you can't eat meat. You can't, it becomes a religious, it becomes fanatical. You know, uh, and, and the only reason maybe in this community uh, there's a more emphasis on low carbon keto is because you know, we're, it, it has been an outlier for so long, and the only way to strengthen and defend and, and defend ourselves is to be able to tell our stories, and we have to advocate for and protect the, the, those people. But I have, I've never said that the whole planet needs to become a carnivorous, <coughs> or, you know, you can say that when you talk to people, because that will, that will calm them down. You need to separate the fanatics from just people that who just want to be able to make the best decision for their own health. Yeah. The, the issue with the vegan is that it's um, because it's a religious thing and it's they, it uses misinformation and it's funded by Big Pharma and Big Ag it is a, it's a different case. Carnivore is a medical treatment for of last resort. Keto is the norm, but doesn't have to do with animal or not. 
I, I'm just getting the idea that everybody needs to at least experience the um, good fuel life. Yeah. Which and um, but just the the because the vegan will use misinformation and um, and it's not base. It doesn't have a basis in science because if you go back to the history, says we're 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 omnivores. Right. It, I, and that's the science. Science doesn't make room. And then I also hear people are lazy about. The, the lazy, I'm going to eat less meat because I don't want to source it from the farm. And I kind of have a trouble with, I, I want to tell a really short story. I got a call to the ER. I'm a family practice doctor. Your patient wants to go home. He's having a heart attack. So I come in and I say, what's the deal? And he says, well, I got to go feed the cattle. I live in a rural area. And it's got to happen. If, and he said, um, that's what I'm going to do. And so the ER doc says, thanks for trying to me. And he says, let's get together by phone tomorrow morning. And then he shakes my hand. He said, I appreciate everything you've ever done. Could we never meet again? Thanks. But the cows come first. And that's what, the, that has to be known to the vegans. That they, the absolute pinnacle of sentient life is a pastured critter. People die. I've been a cowboy and I've risked my life for the cattle. The, that's the best life gets is get I will give a calf an opportunity to live and a cow an opportunity to nurture young for a dozen years and then lights out it's a heck of a lot better to be a cow and go to a feedlot where I've been in the slaughterhouse of Swift because as a occupational medicine doc the whole life cycle is ruminant agriculture is the best sentient life ever why would you take that away it's a heck of a lot better being a cow than a human and I'm still glad to be alive. Sean, yeah. <laughs> so, did you want to say something? Yeah, so I, yes. for, the, for those that you know, don't have personal relationships with legislators, you know, how do we, if I wanted to approach somebody locally, what's the best way to get into like, you know, do I schedule time with my local city councilman? I mean, what, what are the yeah. strategies people can okay. use to, 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 to express and that's, their That's concerns? a great question. So, you should pick up the phone and call your city councilman. There's a very good that's a very good chance that you're gonna actually speak directly to him or her. Uh, it, it, there, shouldn't be, there shouldn't be hesitancy to reach out to any of these elected officials. They have staff, they have assistants, and they have public meetings. And it's just a matter of taking the time to go meet with them, tell them your story, and maybe even think about making a suggestion about what can be done uh, in your particular community that you'd like to see put it out there that's a dynamic and then you also have town hall meetings that's also very powerful when you have a town hall meeting when people stand up and they say this is what's going on for me and this is what I did and what uh, are you interested can you do something about it or you know we have these resources here we have these hospitals we have these universities we have farms we have well you know there's ways to to get the the interest peaked uh, in these scenarios. It's just a matter of not being, of just not being afraid to, to do it. Just making the time, you know, to do that. Um, I'm from Canada, yeah. so it's a, things are a little different up there. But yeah. I steal everything from the CDC, and so I just have some suggestions. I'm yeah. a registered nurse, and I work in acute care. And um, according to the CDC's um, diabetes um, statistics, it says that in 2014, a total of 14.2 million emergency department visitors, visits were recorded with diabetes as the listed diagnosed, diagnosis among adults age 18 or older. So one of the things that, you know, for myself as, a, as an RN, we get to be with patients for like a 12 hour shift. So I think looking at the education, like that is in um, the nursing schools as well as with the doctors, because we actually get to spend then time with the patient and the whole kind of uh, um, family. And I think that, you know, it's kind of like, although I think the N to many is, is good, it's like in the emergency department when they have, unfortunately, 
you know, that first critical incident is kind of like maybe a place where you can look at other things. That's very interesting. I hadn't, I hadn't thought about that, but what went off in my mind when you're telling me that is I want to know how many emergency well, visits. And no, no, no. I'm, I'm thinking about break that down yeah. now to how many people in my district right. have, right. you know, how many, in the hospitals business, there. I was doing a business plan for myself for where the area where I live, right? Um, so, of course, I always kind of like start at the top. I mean, and even the World Health Organization have shifted kind of, but the CDC is definitely. No, no, t without question, that's a, a resource, in, but I'm applying, so one of the, using one of my the, the principles here, if it isn't, doesn't get measured, it doesn't get fixed. So how? So I want to know how many people, how many diabetes emergency visits were there, okay, in my district? Yeah, I know how, how many? And how, how much? Right? How much did? And how much did it cost? Right. And how much of that yeah. money being paid yeah. was it paid by Medicaid dollars? Right. Because the, then all of the taxpayers are right. are contributing exactly. to that. Exactly. And then I can say to the hospital administrator. Why can't we develop a program here or a pilot project? Right. You have all right. of this. The state is paying X. I'd like to cut that down by at least 20% to start. And I like her point about you were talking ER visits and admissions are like two different, different things. Yes. Right. Yeah, because I thought, I thought that was an excellent point. Yeah. yeah, because I can, you could come in to emerge, <coughs> and if um, you're just a visit, you're not an admission, that kind of like we know that we had so many visits, right? Yeah. And maybe it was high sugar, but then you're discharged, like you're released, right? So there are two different numbers that we use. Yeah. Yep, yep. I'm just checking the time here. Um, because we've got... Yeah. It's going to be one, one. It's going to be, we've got the <laughs> next... Uh, Oh, it's at 1:45. Okay, yeah, yeah. still got still got a few more minutes. We'll go to 1:30. Yeah. Um, so the question of medical autonomy is always really controversial in Washington State history, and I just wanted to connect you some reference points of some advocacy movements that have been effective in setting some boundaries. One of them is the consumer self-advocacy movement. It took place a lot in like the 90s around mental health and whether or not you as an adult can make decisions about the medications you take in regards to your mental illness. That have, by and large has supported consumers being able to make that choice as um, mental health. I'd also encourage you to look into the transgender um, movement and their advocacy for informed consent in terms of getting um, obtaining surgery and whether or not um, uh, so that one, and then the last one, you know, obviously abortion can be a tricky thing, but there are some precedents in the United States on state level in terms of when it comes to legislating how medicine is done. Um, to me, it seems like courts are <coughs> focusing on, cons on consumer choice and they're having some autonomy for the medical team to come up and inform consent um, has <coughs> been sellable in a policy system. Okay. Um, I just Thank you. There, there's a, something came to mind too when you were talking about educating the um, providers and trying to, you know, get more education in, like I don't know, medical schools. But one thing that I don't exactly know how this came to be in Washington State, but um, uh, the I think it was the uh, psychiatry um, board or something. They they lobbied and they got it mandatory for all of the doctors and PAs and nurse practitioners, I believe, and may, maybe even others, but she's an occupational therapist. Anyone that has a medical license, mm -hmm. we have to take a, uh, it was like a four hour course in suicide prevention, and that is tied to our licensing. So everyone had to take that. I believe that there was something about that with um, HIV education further back, but there might be some legislative um, rules that might help promote some of that that's not tied to any other um, system other than the, the I, I, I like that idea that then the question becomes is creating the proper curriculum for that. Right. Uh -huh. but, but that might be something that could be developed as a, a better, you know, at least a little more education on 
Well, I think the proper way to, to handle something like that is that if we were to get to a point like that, we would have public hearings and um, have professionals and patients and all to kind of set the parameters for what that that edu that continuing mandatory continuing education uh, should encompass, and then and then asking the profession how many hours uh, should be required and so forth. But but that would be a starting point. Wait, wait, this time we'll take I got discouraged when I read about the Iron Triangle, which is our congressmen are paid and bought by the they're bought by bureaucrats who are only interested in their pension for the most part, and an advocacy group. Since we have lazy national citizenry, then it's only the pharmaceutical industry's lobbyists who affect you. So there's our triangle that makes our laws and runs our world. Okay, I can't change much at the federal level, but at the local level, is that iron triangle still in existence? As you've experienced it, if I become an advocate, one of you aren't going to sue me because you are, you know, I, I have gotten sued or at least uh, censured for being a little bit independent. How much is there an iron triangle problem at the local level? I, I think it, 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 the answer to that question it depends where you're. There are some places where you know local politics is you know very much controlled or managed by various interests. Uh, it all depends, and it depends on what part of the country. There are some states uh, in the South, you know, where the local politics are. That's it. They're, it's everything. So what do we do with that? You're down there. What are you going to do when you've got a really problem community? Well, I think we have to take it as everything in life is that one step at a time with a plan. And, you know, I think I've laid out in my particular case some pretty ambitious things. It may not be quite a bit, but it's what I think is kind of the lowest hanging fruit. That's something that you also have to, when you prioritize what you want to do, you have to view it as what is the lowest hanging fruit, what is the most possible um, thing that I can achieve right now and build from there. So that's another aspect to all of this. Um, but, you know, I'm sure I will encounter, uh, I will encounter those interests or whatever. I mean, New York has its own, just like every state has its own set of interests going on. And, and elected officials are dealing with it all the time. In the back, yes. Be sure to when you when you have your success with all of this, that you disseminate how you did it, your good points, or the things you learned, to not only this community but to anybody else that wants to run for politics. Oh, ab oh absolutely. I, I, believe me, God willing, if I'm successful, I, you know, I come to, to the low carb conference itself. I love all you folks. So it's, it's well, great. So. This was a great talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. I really do appreciate. It. Like I said. And another thing that you learn is that it's always a small percentage of people that are the ones that will change the rest of the world. And I consider groups that people that are interested in topics like this, you are the, the change generators and facilitators. So I'm honored to be in your company. Thank you. Thank you.